Good evening. I hope everybody had a great day today and glad to see so many of you came back to, for, for week two. I see that the numbers have been ticking up over the last couple of minutes and it was great to see everybody uh, coming back. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed the, the wintry weather and didn't have to shovel too much. Last week we covered, <clears throat> pardon me, a lot of uh, <clears throat> information and hopefully the materials were helpful. I do know that uh, last week I rushed through a lot of the information. So if there's any questions, please let me know. I did receive some uh, emails from some of you and even some text. So please uh, feel free to continue doing that if that's helpful. Um, so just curious, you know, I sent an email out, I think a couple of days ago with uh, some information about the, the game stock or game stop stock situation. And uh, just curious if anybody went, rushed out and bought any GameStop stock. Uh, hopefully not, but uh, we'll circle back to that a little bit later. So for tonight's session, uh, the printed materials that hopefully um, most of you have do have some workbook-like pages in there. So if you haven't grabbed a, a, grabbed a printed copy, they are by the bottom entrance at the church. Still some of those left. You can stop by at some point and pick those up. So you know, once again tonight, if you leaf through any materials, there's a tremendous amount of information that's out there, and we're not going to be able to you know, spend time, um, you know, covering everything. And, but what I'm going to try to focus on are some of the areas that are more important. So I do encourage you to review the materials and I'll briefly reference a couple of the other things. So a few quick reminders, um, go ahead and ask questions through the chat feature. And again, just like last, we got set up only the panelists can see. And uh, we will do some poll questions just like we did last week as well, using that poll feature. Those questions will pop up. You simply select your answer. Also, I'd like to uh, thanks, thanks uh, Sue George again for running the show tonight. Uh, Sue does a great job in, in many respects, and we again appreciate her running the uh, technology side of things tonight. So we're going to go ahead and dig in here. And in terms of, um, you know, tonight's title, of course, it is called um, Building a Solid Foundation. And as such, you know, want to start with a quote from Warren Buffett. And many of you probably uh, know the name Warren Buffett. And let me pull that up here. And the quote that you should be seeing on your screen right now simply says, somebody sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. And you know this just simply reinforces that financial mm -hmm. success does not happen overnight. And just like last week, we talked about with the, the investment side of the equation, it does take time to get on track and into that, that good routine. So again, like last week with investments, patience and discipline are some words that I mentioned last week. That's important with all financial situations. So that's important as well with a lot of that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, something else is, you know, mistakes and improper planning. Those can cost us dearly. And I, I would guess most of us uh, on the, the um, call tonight can think of a time over the course of our life, lifetime that we made a financial stake, uh, mistake. And I know I, I have as well. So uh, there, it, it's easy to make mistakes and improper planning, but uh, we live and we learn and we improve. Um, something this past Sunday, if you were paying attention during Pastor Stephen's sermon, and I must say I was, now I was on the sound crew, so I was sort of a captive audience uh, with, uh, I guess, you know, only a couple other people in the room. But one of the things he was talking about in a sermon was the blind spots that we often encounter in life's journey. And I would say, just like, you know, he was sharing, there's no exception in the investment and financial planning world. There's lots of blind spots that can get us into trouble as well. So tonight's conversation is... Um, you know, is going to be relevant for folks of all ages, but here's what we're going to be covering tonight. We're going to start working through um, how to take financial inventory and some best practices there. We'll talk about uh, some tips and traps with insurances, and there's lots to, to work through there. Uh, debt management, budgeting, cash flow, those type of things. Uh, look to, you know, talk, uh, spend a little bit of time saving for the future. And uh, close to the end, we'll hit college education planning. I know that's, that's relevant for some of you. And sorry, jumped ahead a little bit too quickly. Um, and then college, uh, you know, as I said, college education planning. And then we'll finish with some characteristics of some financially savvy uh, people uh, that, that are out there. So we're going to move along and start with the financial inventory side of it. So in your materials book, and again, um, as said last week, unfortunately, I did not get page numbers into printed materials. 
if you have a if you have a PDF version, there are page numbers on there. So I think it's page 35, uh, of course, in the PDF version, but they're one of the first pages in your printed copy underneath the correct tab, you're going to see a blank net worth statement. The one on your screen you see is filled in and there's an example. Uh, but when we think about a net worth statement, this is something that certainly would highly encourage everybody to do at least once a year, just to give you that sense of what your uh, net worth is. And at the top of the screen, I'm just gonna uh, focus on, on what's on the screen right now. Um, you know, we start with the assets. So whether it's cash, typically uh, what's in the bank, whether it's uh, savings accounts, CDs, anything of those natures, um, taxable investments, those are really non-retirement accounts. Uh, qualified retirement are those retirement accounts, 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, et cetera. And then if, if, there's, if, it, if you have a life insurance policy that has cash value, that's typically an asset that you own. So there's a spot for that. And then uh, for property, any of your real estate would also fall into there. Then of course, after you total up all your assets, then you would take a look at your liabilities. So do you have a mortgage? Do you have other types of loans that are outstanding? And of course you add up all of the assets, subtract the liabilities and you get the, the net worth that's there. Now, there will be a electronic spreadsheet that I will be sharing uh, via email probably in the next couple of days with you that will allow you to actually type in um, certain areas and it'll, it'll uh, you know, do the addition and make everything appear where it would be. So if you're computer savvy and want to do that way, uh, the, the spreadsheet is, is, is synced up that it should be very easy. You type in some stuff and I'll add it for you. Um, again, I will send it out via email for you to use in coming days. So want to uh, take a, a poll question here as we get started. And I'm going to bring that poll question up. And as you should see on your screen right now, um, actually, I got the wrong one up there. I apologize. Let me pull that down and start over. Let's go back to the correct one here. Okay, uh, let me end that one. Here we go. Uh, so today, this first one is about uh, net worth. So in regards to my own net worth statement, think about your net worth statement, four options. You never created a net worth statement and you have no idea what net worth, what your net worth is. Uh, B is you have no formal net worth statement, but you have a pretty good idea of what your net worth is. Um, then C is have a formal net worth statement, but you're just, you can't re recall what that is, not really remembering what that might be. And then D is you do have a formal net worth statement and you know exactly what your net worth is. So go ahead and, and, and answer uh, what is, um, is your situation to your, your best of your knowledge. And in a moment here, we'll bring up the results here. It's trending, um, trending sort of two ways here. Give a, a couple more seconds for a few folks to, to vote. All right, so let's pull up the results here. And as you can see, it was sort of a close tie between B and D, which is good because B and D both, um, you know, is a sense basically that you have a pretty good sense of what your net worth actually is. And I think that's the important component of it. 40% um, of, of the folks on the call tonight don't have a uh, formal net worth statement, but again, a pretty good idea. And then uh, the next highest percentage, almost the same amount of people, do have a formal net worth statement and know exactly what it is. And again, the point is that's the important component of it and making sure that you uh, know what you have is uh, something that, that's certainly important. So if we move along um, to, to the next um, part of the financial inventory, and we're gonna talk a little bit about a cash flow statement. So again, the net worth statement, that gives you the sense of what you own uh, or what you're loaning uh, but now cash flow statements is what it says it is. It's basically what's coming in the door or going out the door. And again, in the PDF uh, on page 37 and any of the printed, printed materials, there is a blank cash flow statement that you can use to write in what your situation is. Similar to the other one, um, I will be sending out a, a, um, a spreadsheet that you can simply just type it in and it'll do all the math for you and add everything together and I'll send that out via email. 
So when we think about um, you know the, the the cash flow that's out there, um, you know, sort of break that into obviously what's coming in the door. Most of these areas at the top are self-explanatory as you come down through. Whether you're in retirement and have a pension of Social Security, whether you're still working and has salary and bonuses and all those type of things, uh, that's there. These you would you do want to list your pre-tax dollars there. So whatever the, the pre-tax numbers are, uh, we'll you know, consider taxation a little bit later. The bottom part of the screen uh, are really categories that can change at some point in the future with the exception of your basic living expenses. And you'll see that that's shaded in a, in a light green there. So liability or your loan payments, those debt payments, hopefully at some point they come to an end. Uh, insurance premiums often at, they have some type of a sunset provision, uh, whether maybe that's term life insurance or liability or some of the uh, you know disability, some of the other types that are out there. Income taxes will fluctuate, of course, through time. Uh, savings you save during your working career, typically not during retirement. So those are some areas that will at some point either disappear or change. And when you're looking for income taxes just would suggest look at your previous year's tax return, uh, the actual taxes paid, not look at your paycheck and see what was withheld uh, from that one. And plan savings, that's retirement account contribution uh, or other intentional savings. So the number that's shaded in, in green here is a number that you would back into. Um, and, and one of the big keys, and you'll see here at the bottom of the screen is a net cash flow. And this one it shows at zero. So what is net cash flow? Net cash flow is really e either a surplus or a deficit that you run every year. And I think that one of the best ways to figure out what is your net cash flow, do you run a surplus or deficit? If you use a bank account sort of as your in or out um, vehicle that your, your income lands into and you also pay your expenses, that might be your, your bank checking account. For a lot of people it is. Well, if you take a look at your bank checking account or your bank savings, wherever those in or out accounts are, and say at the beginning of the year, let's say you have 20,000 in, that, in that, that, that account. Uh, at the end of the year, if you have $40,000 in the account, I would argue that you, un maybe unintentionally, but you had a, net, a positive net cash flow of $20,000. You started the year with 20, you ended up with 40, and that means you didn't you know, spend everything that was coming in. So at that point, you have a positive net cash flow. Um, right here on the screen right now, you'll see an example of a zero uh, net cash flow, meaning what came in went out the door in certain ways. And basically, we backed into the basic living expenses number there. The spreadsheet I send out, it does the math for you. You don't have to figure that out. But in the booklet, um, and uh, in a PDF, there are some explanations on one of the pages that really walks you through how to put this together. This one is a little bit more complicated just to sort of figure out on your own. So if you can use the spreadsheet to do it, I would encourage you to do it because everything's teed up and you just have to ask, you have to find out what is your net cash flow. Speaking of net cash flow, I move to the next slide and you see this one's a negative 29,000. Everything up above was the same. The only thing that changed was a basic living expense, where in this case, the spending was higher, spending 529 compared to the 500. Therefore, that net cash flow, it's a negative, meaning that you're basically spending out a deficit. So I don't want to spend a, a lot of time going through that here tonight. But again, there's instructions in the book to work through that uh, and, and uh, some spreadsheets that will be emailed that will hopefully be helpful. Uh, the sort of uh, next component I want to talk about with uh, taking financial in, uh, inventory is, is taking a look at, at, at emergency reserves. So I'm going to pull down that slide and I'm going to pull up, uh, this is going to be from, let me slide it over there and let me share this again. And that's the one I'm looking for. So this should be um, right out of your book. Uh, the booklet again, page 39 of the cash flow. Hopefully, it's it's clear. If it's not, um, it'll clear up a little bit uh, on us here. But sometimes when you share some smaller print, it doesn't come across too well. But when you're figuring out your emergency reserves, so what should you have tucked away for those financial emergencies? There's a worksheet built into here, and that's what I want to point out. Uh, that you can fill that in. So to figure out what should you have in, tucked away for emergency reserves, 
really you need to figure, you know, list here, uh, the first spot is to list your annual income and then subtract what your savings are gonna be. So these might be what you're saving through retirement accounts or maybe other savings, whether it's planned or unplanned savings. Like I said, you know, if you have an extra 20,000 in your bank account at the end of the year, that's unplanned savings perhaps, but that's, that's actual savings that you've had. Um, and then the outflows, uh, you simply take the income less the savings, and then that will be your annual outflows. And in a sense, that's the number you want to base uh, emergency reserves off of. So directly below it, it's a chart with some different categories. So uh, how much an emergency reserve should you have? And typically fi financial professionals suggest somewhere between three to 12 months worth of outflows that you should have tucked away in that rainy day fund. Uh, here's some parameters, for instance, I'm not gonna read all these, but the first one, you, know, you should have three months of emergency reserves. If you have dual income households, so two incomes in your household, both are salaried and both are in stable job and, and industry. And you can see the other ones in the booklet uh, that you see there in the PDF. And you know the, 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 the one with the highest amount of emergency reserves is really nine to 12 months worth where there maybe you have a single or it could be a dual income household with maybe salaried or variable income and a cyclical or volatile industry. So you can take a look at this and, and get a sense of where you fall in that area to determine how much maybe you should consider having in emergency reserves. So what you do is simply take the outflows from above that and carry that through divided by 12, meaning by 12 months, you come up with your monthly sort of outflow that we have, multiply that by the number of months that are directly above it. And all of a sudden, now you have a sense of what you should have in the emergency reserve level at a minimum amount. And then you can figure, well, what do I have in bank savings and, and all those type of things at that point in time? So again, um, I know that there's lots of information uh, that, that is there. Um, you know, that, that's something that's more information in the book, uh, but we can say uh, doing that, um, you know, taking a look at that. So I'm gonna pull up an example here. And yes, I see a comment saying that John and Jane Doe have done pretty well. Uh, we're still using John and Jane Doe for the emergency reserves. So um, their total annual income on this example is the $400,000. Subtracting out, they save $44,000 on an annual basis. So their total uh, out, their annual outflows are about $356,000. We divide that by 12. So they're spending about $30,000 a month. They are in sort of a, a situation, probably they should have about six months of needed expenses. So you multiply that and John and Jane Doe should have about 178,000 tucked away in emergency reserves is where that is. So again, um, you know, walk through that fairly quickly, but hopefully that sinks in more information in, in the booklet about it. Where to put those, those emergency reserves in something very liquid, so in bank account or something where you can get at, at a, a relatively quickly basis. So not Bitcoin, not Tesla stock, not AMC stock, uh, and not game stock as, as, as well. So we're going to move along into the insurance uh, part of the evening, so to speak, and get a sense of um, you know, what the different types of insurance are. So you know, in a financial plan in your situation, insurance is an important component of that. And keep in mind that the main purpose of insurance is really to transfer risk, transfer that risk from you uh, to the insurance company. Uh, there's gonna be six types of insurance that's out there uh, that most people should have during their working careers. And for those of you who are past your working career, there's gonna be a little bit more next week on the types you should have in retirement as well. So question, first question is, did you know that you could get insurance for body parts? So you could get body parts insurance and you see Julia Roberts there on the, on the screen. Um, Julia, I think still has for the longest time, uh, she had a $30 million uh, insurance policy on her smile. So it is pretty common for, for Hollywood celebrities to protect physical items of some sort. On the right hand side, you see Bruce Springsteen right there. Um, he had, uh, I think it was back in the 80s, he had a $6 million policy on his voice, of course, which leads me to think, you know, maybe, uh, maybe Pastor Steven should get some voice insurance. What do we think? I, I don't know. Maybe that, that'd be a good idea. Um, so here's another one. Did you also know that you could get alien uh, abduction 
insurance. Uh, this, of course, is also known as UFO insurance. And for this one, my understanding is that the premiums are pretty reasonable uh, for, for, for those. So we're going, in all seriousness, now going to take a look at the first of the six types of life insurance that everybody should have uh, or, or ha you know, at least consider. And uh, again, talking right now, ma mainly during your working career. So, um, you know, there's a lot of information in your book as well. Um, and one thing I want to make a comment of and be clear about, you know, the materials in the book do make it seem in some cases that there are some absolutes to you should do this or you shouldn't do this or what, whatever that, that may be. And just want to make it clear that there's many ways to get to that same end result. So there might be some things that say do this or do that. Like we said last week, there's not always a right or wrong answer or, or a way to, to go about things. So if you're doing something differently or in the future you do something differently than maybe it says in here, that, that's perfectly fine. There's ways to get there. So again, no absolutes uh, on that. But for many people, when we take a look at term versus permanent, when we talk about life insurance, for many people, especially during your working career, it, it's often better to use level term insurance uh, instead of permanent whole life insurance. One of the reasons is that it's uh, much, much cheaper to do term life insurance. You can also pick your time frame um, from that kind. So the example that you see on the screen, if you're a 40 year old male, and if you're trying to get $500,000 of life insurance coverage, if you get a whole life policy, meaning that you're going to pay this premium for the rest of your life, in a sense, to keep that 500,000 of coverage afloat, your premium is going to be 6,300 and change, um, you know, every year. That's a pretty hefty premium. On the other hand, if you choose a term life policy, a level term policy, um, and choose a 20 year time period, basically to insure you between age 40 and age 60, that annual premium becomes a much, much more affordable annual $344. Again, that won't go up and the whole life insurance one shouldn't either. So for to protect uh, you in your working career, that's where it's a lot cheaper and a lot more reasonable often to do the term life insurance uh, for those. So, um, you know, one of the things I always encourage people to be careful of is using life insurance as an investment vehicle. Um, sometimes there are some professionals out there that, that sell life insurance and they, they say, well, you can also borrow from it or you can do this or that. Uh, and it's a good investment vehicle as well. My opinion is it's not a good investment vehicle. It's a very expensive investment vehicle. You can see the premiums are very expensive and keep in mind insurance is insurance investments are insurance, uh, or investments are, um, I'm sorry, investments are investments, insurance is insurance is what I'm trying to say. Um, but again, there may be some instances, again, where it might be good to do the whole life uh, component or the permanent type of insurance, but just make sure you're working with a professional to understand really what you're getting into. There's a lot of insurance agents that love to sell whole life policies because their uh, commission is massively higher for selling a whole life than is a term life. So just making sure that it's it's best for your situation. Uh, same thing, you know, people often ask, should I get life insurance for kids? Uh, I'm not sure if it's all that prevalent as much as it is used to be, but Gerber life insurance or some of the other ones. Um, there's some situations it absolutely does make, it does make sense. Uh, in a lot of situations, I would say it probably doesn't. But again, in some situations, it would make sense where, uh, especially if you want to lock in low rates, uh, you know, the younger the person, the lower that, that rate you can lock in. Um, and also, depending on health, uh, later in life, sometimes you're not insurable because uh, you have to go through underwriting for health, um, health underwriting. So younger you know, kids are typically much more insurable. So there, there are some ways to do it. I would not save in a life insurance policy for a kid in a way to send them to college and saving for college, that, that would definitely be something I would not suggest there. Uh, accidental death coverage, that is sort of what it sounds like. It does provide twice the death benefit um, if you die by a, a type of an accident. And I guess what I would say with that is no matter how you die, uh, you know, your family's financial needs aren't going to change. So I'm not sure if it makes sense to pay extra to have um, that sort of double accidental life coverage. Um, be before talking about how much life insurance do I need, you know, I just want to sort of reiterate life insurance met methodology 
those are these are things that can be debated debated and a lot of professionals have you know a variety of opinions that are out there so as i said earlier there's not really a right or wrong and i was thinking about this sort of you know it's in a lot of ways it's it's like religion you know as presbyterians we often think our theology is the only way but of course that doesn't mean whether it's the methodist or the baptist down the street that they're wrong um, so back to the insurance component of it again, it's just, you know, the key is to work with a professional that you trust and make sure they're just not trying to sell you something that gets the biggest commission there. Um, if we sort of wrap up the, the life insurance component and talk about how much life coverage should you have, uh, really, you should have enough to support, you know, uh, take care of any existing debt that's out there and also support your family, at least for a period of time. So there's some rules of thumbs out there. The chart that's on this slide and on the screen right now, a general rule of thumb is uh, multiple of your salary. So depending on what your age range, if you're 45 or younger, you know, having coverage that's a multiple of your salary, multiple. So if your salary is $50,000, you should probably have 500,000 of coverage. And you can see as you get older, maybe you don't need all that coverage as you have there. Um, from that component. So some rules of thumbs there uh, for that term life, more often than not, the term's going to end by the time you retire. And um, it, the last thing I would mention there, it is important for each spouse to have coverage. Uh, even if there's a stay at home spouse, it is important and, and more important, especially if you have children uh, there. So just a couple of things to, to keep in mind. So we're gonna move along and talk disability insurance. So with disability insurance, you know, that um, I would say is maybe one of your most, most valuable assets during your working career, which of course is your income stream. Statistics out there that are about one out of every three people at some point during their working career will have some type of a disability that typically lasts 90 consecutive days, uh, again, at some point during their working career. So the, the different components you want to look at there, and there's some pretty good information in the book, looking at length of coverage, uh, with le length of coverage, short-term versus long-term. Short-term basically gives you protection for up to three to six months. Uh, long-term basically takes it from either three or six months on, uh, usually up to age 65. If you're working, you should have some type of a disability uh, income insurance to protect that. Um, so then the, the question is, well, what percent of income should I have covered? Generally, 60 to 70 percent is the, the typical amount uh, that you want to cover of your gross income. Um, in some cases, and, and that's typically the limits. If you have a policy and, and if you're working, most employers do provide this as an employee benefit. Um, but the limit that you can typically be insured for for disability income is about 60 to 70 percent. Sometimes they'll go as high as 80 percent, but there's limitations there. Um, if, if you're a high income earner, sometimes there's a monthly benefit cap. Uh, sometimes that might be $10,000 that's capped of at a monthly benefit. So if you're making, a, a, you know, if you have a sizable income, there's often limitations to what that is. Uh, own ac occupation versus any occupation. This is important. Um, you know, more often than not, you should have your own occupation type of a definition of the policy. And to use an example, uh, let's say there's doctors out there and, and doctors, you know, using certain things. If you're a surgeon and something happens to your hand and, and disability, you know, it can be almost anything that puts you not, you know, not allowing you to do whatever your chosen profession is. So let's say a surgeon has some type of a hand injury. Uh, they're not able to perform the task of their job. If they have an own occupation definition, they will get that coverage. If they have an any occupation difference that are you know definition, they won't get they won't get those monthly payments because that's ba any occupation basically means you can go out there and you can if you know if your hands aren't doing so well and you can work in some other ways any other job that you can work with that's where any occupation. So again, you you want to if you can make sure that you have that own occupation uh, definition. A lot of people say, well, I'll just you know, rely on social security disability benefits. Uh, those are very strict requirements. And basically, you know, if you cannot get any job, if, if your disability does not allow you to get any job whatsoever, then social security may kick in as long as that disability will likely last at least 12 months or more permanently. So again, not a whole heck of a lot of people with a shorter term disabilities that often is more common will see that. 
Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, more often than not, it's employer provided. Uh, you can get supplemental coverage. That is very, very expensive. I know some, uh, some doctors and some other professionals who maybe the employer provides 60% coverage and they'll buy additional supplemental coverage and it is wickedly expensive. So uh, just being aware of that. As we move along, uh, health insurance, um, best advice is never ever go without health insurance. It's, it's obviously very critical. Um, if you have your coverage through employee or employers, uh, through your employment, uh, most times employers provide a few different choices for health insurance, multiple plans. And these days, especially, they often provide an option that's a high deductible one, and then a plan with a lower, lower deductible plan. And what you want to do is really determine which plan is, is, is best for you. And mathematically speaking, it's important to find what's called the break even point. Um, you can see an example here on the screen. And basically, you know, if you have a $4,000 deductible, that would be a high deductible plan. And your annual premium is $1,300. Or I'm sorry, if your annual premium is $1,300 cheaper than the equivalent plan with a, with a $22,000 deductible, if you think about it with a $2,000 deductible plan, if you meet your deductible, you're paying $2,000. You're also paying um, you know, uh, $1,300 uh, more for to have that lower deductible plan. So in this case, your break even becomes 3,300, and that's what the second bullet point shows. That is the 1,300 plus the lower deductible, 3,300 bucks. So basically, the math works out. If you're spending more than the 3,300 of a deductible, uh, meaning of a $4,000 deductible plan, financially speaking, the lower deductible plan makes more sense. So there's some more information in a booklet about that as well. But trying to figure out which one is it. Um, I know for our family a couple of years ago, we converted to a high deductible plan. And with a high deductible plan, you know, you're, you're almost putting that bet out there that, you know, things are going to be, you're, you're going to be healthy and you're not going to spend a whole deductible. If you spend a whole $4,000 deductible, you're, you're going to be better off in a low deductible plan. Uh, of course, the, I think the year we did that, my middle daughter actually broke her arm, not once, but twice uh, in, in a, uh, you know, in a fairly short period of time. And of course, we met our deductible fairly easily. The other thing about health insurance, uh, those of you who have a high deductible plan, those typically come with a health savings account. That's what an HSA comes. Uh, or a lot of employers, if you don't have a high deductible plan, they offer what's called a healthcare reimbursement account where you can get deductions for putting money in there for the contribution. And then when you use money for those, it does not create a taxable event. So it's uh, double, uh, you know, tax-free, which is, which is pretty good there. Um, in terms of homeowners or renter's insurance, um, I'm sure everybody has that. You certainly should. There's some minimum coverage levels that are out there uh, for not just the, uh, the property itself, but for liability. And, and, you know, for minimum amount of personal liability, coverage should be 250. The preference would be closer to 500,000 for that. Um, when, you, when you're looking for those. Uh, the comment about having a higher deductible, most homeowners insurance uh, comes with either $500 deductible option or a thousand. If you have a higher, if you choose the higher deductible, of course, that's gonna keep your premiums lower. But if every year you have a claim and you're paying the thousand dollar deductible, that's similar to the, the health insurance, that's not going to be a good trade-off. Um, so from that standpoint, um, you know, more often than not, as long as you don't make claims, having a higher deductible will help keep the, the premiums lower. Um, the other thing that, that's very important that, that is not always out there is guaranteed replacement cost. If something happened to your home, uh, the cost to rebuild your home is often significantly higher than what you could sell your home for right now. So if you look at your policy, hopefully it's this guaranteed replacement cost. And if you see the, the replacement cost, you think, wow, that's a lot more than what I could sell it for. That is, that is the case. Um, and then in terms of special perils, uh, that's earthquakes or sinkholes, flood damage, uh, sometimes water damage, uh, seepage through the walls is typically not covered in homeowners policies. So uh, depending on where you live, you, you, know, you wanna have some, some of those coverages. You know, I know I think we have for earthquakes and sinkholes um, and we did have some water damage protection at, at points too. So for those of you who live in or near Palmyra might want some sinkhole coverage. I know there's some history there. 
Uh, finally, down here in the, the bottom right corner, there's a snippet of, uh, if you don't recognize, that's the Fresh P Prince of Bel Air. So that's Will uh, Smith. That's, I think, his current home in uh, California, in Southern California, which is worth about $42 million right now. So I would say it's probably pretty safe to say that uh, his premiums cost, uh, homeowners premiums cost a little bit than mine does. We take a look at, at auto insurance and it's important to of course have adequate uh, coverage there. And again, there's liability coverage with uh, auto insurance as well. So some, some minimum and preferred coverage is there. You can see uh, all this information is in the book. Collision coverage is basically is that replacement of the vehicle. So uh, you know, if you drive an older vehicle, maybe you don't need collision coverage. If your vehicle has, you know, if it, if it gets totaled and it's only worth $2,000, is that worth paying an additional premium for getting some of that? Um, speaking of, of older vehicles, that's uh, you know, a car sitting there. I feel like I saw George Porter driving that, that car at some point over the years. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't know. Maybe that's where I came up with the picture. Um, but, um, you know, with the, you know, the other thing with, with auto insurance, the higher deductible, similar thing, similar story that you have with your homeowner's insurance. If you have a higher deductible, you're going to have lower premiums. So typically this is probably where I'd make a joke about my wife's driving and, uh, you know, deductibles and, and meeting deductibles and so forth. But I think she's in the very next room and I forgot to lock my office door. So I'll skip the joke for, for this evening and, and we'll move, move along here. Um, the next type, and if you tuned in uh, before and saw some of the trivia questions, this was one of the trivia questions that was rolling beforehand. And umbrella insurance is excess liability coverage. So you also have liability coverage as we just talked about in your homeowners and auto policies, um, but this is on top of those. And generally, you know, the, the liability coverage you have in your homeowners or auto will cover you almost wherever you're at and will go ahead and um, you know, take care of, uh, you know, of, of whatever, if you do need any liability protection, meaning if something happens and somebody comes after you and somebody uh, goes into litigation against you. Um, the, some of the reasons to have excess liability coverage, you know, in this day and age, there's uh, sometimes where victims ask for more and more, especially if they see you live in a nice house, drive a nice car, or think you have some uh, substantial assets. So it's extremely rare that anybody has to utilize their umbrella policy, but it's good to have that there if you need. Now, you know, if I take a bucket of water and I throw out on my sidewalk and then I'm sitting in some of my front door and it freezes and watch somebody walk by and they fall, and obviously I intentionally threw that and they say, hey, you know, you put water in the sidewalk and I fell, they may have a case that, that the, you know, that the excess liability would come in, meaning that your uh, other component wouldn't be there. So uh, that is a, uh, a good case there. So, you know, who should have umbrella insurance? Uh, 250, if you have 250,000, a quarter of a million or more in net worth, and, you know, most people will get to that number, of course, at some point in your lifetime, it's normally advisable. So uh, premiums are very inexpensive, typically 150 to $200 uh, for a million dollars of coverage. The least amount, I believe the least amount of umbrella insurance you can get is a million dollars of coverage. Uh, that's, that's the base. And again, that's typically 150 uh, to $200 uh, there. Uh, there was a question that came in of 250, is that 250K per person or 250 um, or per family? If the person that put that in there, can you clarify, uh, is that uh, for which uh, for, for which one? Is that, um, you know, 250 in the net worth I just talked about, or is that for auto insurance or one of the others? That would be helpful, just so I'm answering the, the right answer there, and we'll come back to it. Uh, net worth. Okay, thank you. So talking about looking in the book uh, where I just mentioned 250k of net of net worth, uh, really at a family basis for that standpoint. You know, if you get above those limits, that's where it's good to start having umbrella insur insurance for that one. So thank you for clarifying, and uh, folks continue to answer ask questions via the uh, that that feature. So I'm going to pull up another poll question here, and let me make sure I'm getting the right one. And here it goes. And by the way, Sue George, I did uh, check the box that allows the panelists to vote. Last week, I forgot to check the box that allows panels to vote. 
and she wasn't able to vote. So uh, now everybody's able to vote. So the question there is my current comfort level with my insurance coverage. We just talked about six different types of insurance. You see the answers there. Is it A, you feel confident that you're well protected? B, you were confident, but maybe in the last you know 10 minutes or so we've been talking through this, you're less sure. Uh, C is I definitely need to look into this. Uh, D is I have no idea what I have and what I need. Um, so go ahead and answer what your question is, just trying to get a sense of uh, where, where the group is. And excellent, see a lot of ones. And I got a text from Sue saying I still can't vote. What a shame, I, I checked the box. So um, sorry about that, Sue. Um, so most people, and let me uh, pull up the results here, the vast majority feel comfort, uh, confident you're well protected, which is good, which is good to hear. Uh, some others you know, selected B that maybe uh, need to look into some things, and that's pretty typical. I should do that uh, from that one. So um, some, good, some good thoughts there. When we're talking about insurance and some money-saving tips that um, we'll, uh, you know, we're going to take a look at right now, it's always good to use an, an independent insurance agent, somebody that's not captive, meaning that they can uh, provide any policies that are out there. Uh, always a good way to do it. Um, and it's good to, to put that out to pricing at, at, on a regular basis. So every few years or so, get multiple quotes. Uh, so the, the same basic coverage, but see if you can get better pricing out there. Uh, increasing your deductible, we've already talked about that as a way to probably bring down your premium. And then discounts, you know, a lot of um, for uh, homeowners or, or for some of the others, there's uh, a bunch of discounts that are out there. Some automatically are granted. Sometimes you must request them. So don't be afraid to ask your agent for some of that. So uh, we're going to move along to the, the uh, debt management and budgeting section here. And sorry, I jumped way ahead. So when we talk about you know, managing debt and um, you know, there, there's a lot to think about through there and it's easy to get into debt. Um, and you know, there, there's really you know, one of the most important things I think of having a successful financial future is, is properly managing that debt so that you're managing the debt and the debt's not managing you. So there are really two types of debt that's out there. There's good debt and there's bad debt. Uh, good debt is basically, as you can see, anything that you need and cannot pay cash for and has a low rate. Um, and, and most often that, that's an investment that might grow in value or generate income. So you, you know, paying a mortgage, your home is an investment. So again, your home likely will grow in value. It's also gonna um, you know, at some point generate income or it's an investment that's going to, to, to do uh, at least the first half of that. Uh, education loans, you know, that's going to provide income to you in the future. So as long as it's reasonable, it's something you need and, um, you know, you can't pay the cash for it as a low rate, that's good debt. Uh, a car payment, if it's, you know, I would say if it's, if it's a low rate and you need it, a car payment uh, is, is something that could qualify as low debt as well. Um, now, again, the car doesn't grow in value or generate income, so it's only really if it's a low rate and you need it. Um, so you want to think a little bit about wants versus needs. You know, I think about it in this way, you may want a Starbucks coffee, but do you need a Starbucks coffee? Probably not. Uh, so bad debt is sort of the opposite, of course, of good debt, which is anything you want instead of need that you cannot pay cash for and items that typically will not grow in value or generate income uh, within there. One word on debt in general, whether it's good or bad, the, the best rule of thumb, this is in, in the book on the bottom of page 48, uh, talks about uh, should not exceed your debt payment, should not exceed 36% of your gross monthly income. So if you take all of your annual debt payments and figure out what are you paying for all your debt, uh, mm -hmm. divide that into your, um, in terms of your annual income, hopefully it's less than 36%. Um, otherwise, it might be a little bit excessive there. The next slide talks about ways to manage your debt. I'm going to move, uh, sort of jump through here, but you can see the different ways. Obviously, consolidating debt there is, is one. Uh, boosting take-home pay, that's real. If you get a large refund come tax time, there's a way to, to, to do that, you know, to get more take-home pay throughout the year and then put those towards debt payments to help pay down that debt. That's the point there. Um, you can cut back on some discretionary expenses there. It's always good to list your debt payments in the workbook, um, 
there is a spot on page 49 where you can list in sort of walks through of uh, how to sort of put a plan together to attack that, uh, doing that, and how best to accelerate uh, debt payments. So some important things there. Uh, budgeting, something else that's, that's important. Um, also, again, in, in the book, I'm jumping over some things that are in the book. Page 50 has quite a bit of good information on debt management, some Q&As within there uh, that hopefully is meaningful. Um, and then when we're talking about creating a budget, uh, a lot of people don't, a lot of people do. Um, if, if you're a type of person who feels like you're you know, not in control of your spending, then it, it's something that you should really uh, do there. And you want to get a sense of what you're spending um, you know, your money on and figuring out, is it a want or is it a need? And mostly, you know, wants are more discretionary in nature, uh, needs are non-discretionary. So the discretionary ones, the, the wants are the ones obviously you can cut back on at time. So on page 51 in a workbook, it sort of works you through some different ways to uh, go ahead and put together a, a budget. Um, then on page 52 in the workbook and what you see a snippet of on your screen right now is a, an expense worksheet. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you can handle this. And again, there's an expense worksheet on page 52. There's a couple other ones further back in the resources section in case you uh, want to do a couple of different ones. But you can use this for budgeting. You can say, okay, this is what I'm budgeting either monthly or annually for each of these categories. And again, I cut off in the booklet, there's, there's more below the fold there. Um, or you can track expenses and, and see what have I already spent on those or what have I been spending on those on either monthly or annual basis way to do that. Uh, in terms of tracking outflows, there's also good ways to do that. There's some apps out there. If you're technology savvy, uh, Mint is, is a, a long time one. Pocket Guard, every, every dollar, personal capital, there's, there's a whole slew of matter out there. But basically, you want to track those outflows. Um, I'm a spreadsheet nerd, in, in case you haven't been able to, to see that so far. So I keep uh, you know, track of everything in the spreadsheet and just categorize it by, um, you know, by category there. And you can see this is a snippet. I'm going to send an electronic uh, document, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, for tracking outflows that have all the months there. Again, you, you type it in, it adds it up for you and all those type of things. Uh, what I would say is that it's important to track your outflows. If you're not doing it, it's great to get a sense of where are you spending your money. Even if you have no budget issues, you know, it's, it's a good, good thing to do. I have encouraged my clients to do that point. I remember a handful of years ago when my clients came in uh, not long after and they did that exercise, they said, holy, holy cow, you know, I, I realized I'm, I spent $2,400 at Starbucks in the past year, which is just crazy. I think the math comes out that's almost $50 a week in Starbucks. It sounds high to me and I don't want to insult anybody that's listening tonight that may, might spend $50 a week in Starbucks, but it sounds a little bit high uh, in, in my opinion. So um, again, the next couple pages in the book that uh, are not on the screen here, um, there's some, some information in there that's hopefully uh, useful to you. So we're gonna jump ahead and talk about saving for the future. And the first thing that's gonna pop up here is a verse from Proverbs that as you can read, in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devour devours all that he has. And of course, you know, this talks about importance of saving for the future and looking ahead. Uh, this may be one of the most important concepts of all the sessions we work uh, through. And, and again, we don't have time to go too much in depth, but I think it's on page 56 of the materials. There's some good information out there as, as well. So going to quickly pull up another poll question here um, at this point in time. So let me set this one up. And for this poll question says in 2020, the following percentage of US households are millionaires in terms of investable assets. So not including real estate, but in terms of investable assets, what percentage of US households do you believe in 2020 are millionaires? You see the four choices there, 2.3%, 6.7, 11.1 uh, or 14.8. Of course, being a millionaire is not quite what it used to be, but uh, still an impressive thing to, uh, to attain. I see lots of people answering this one, taking some guesses so far. Uh, pull it up here momentarily, but it looks like we have a winner, and that is the correct answer. 
So 6.7% uh, is the correct answer uh, for that one. Uh, so 6.7% of, of US households are millionaires in 2020 as a little bit of trivia there. So um, when we talk about uh, saving money, it's most of it's about you know making it a priority as, as you go through there. So part of it is setting goals and then writing down those goals. So whether it's short-term goals, uh, which are typically five years or less that are coming out or long-term goals. Uh, if you're further than five years from retirement, I would say long-term goal is, you know, one of your most important one is probably retirement, right? Um, the other area that on here, and, and this is included in the book as well on page uh, 57 of the PDF, where there's a column that, that you can categorize each one as a need or want. Um, so there's a place in the booklet to write down short-term goals. Uh, again, that's five years or less, and then long-term goals of five uh, years or more. After you do that, then I would, you know, maybe in the, uh, off in the margin, write the priority. You know, what, what's your number one priority goal? So you can uh, label those and help you meet some of those, those goals. Um, now, you know, it says if, if dollar amount, if known. Um, if you have a, you know, looking at retirement, if that's one of your longer term goals or even short term goal. Um, if you don't know the amount, that's okay. Uh, we're going to talk about next week about how to, to figure that out uh, as we do there. So retirement savings, a couple of rules of thumb. This was, I believe, also a trivia question was, that was rolling beforehand. Um, you, know, you, you know what your goals are and, and how much should you be saving? Throughout your working career, if you're saving 15% of your income on an annual basis, the percent probability, this is present pro, a percent probability of success of your money lasting until age 95 is a pretty strong probability. If you only save 10% of your income throughout your, your working career, there's a decent chance that you might run out of money before age 95. So typically 15% uh, is a good number to, to, to aim for. If you're into your working career and you haven't been saving 15%, you can still catch up. You know, it's not, a, you know, it's, you don't have to give up. Uh, you might wanna kick it up a little bit. You see the probability of success of saving 24 per, or 20% is even higher. Uh, closer there. We use age 95. People are living longer and often uh, that's where, you know, especially a, a couple, you know, if there's two of you uh, trying to get there, there's decent chances that one of you are going to, to live that way. And as a side note to bottom, you can see uh, 401k participants at Vanguard save an average of 7%. So uh, a lot of people don't do that. Another rule of thumb, sort of these multiple and these uh, sort of guideposts to, along your career, if you pick where you're at in that, that component and think, okay, I'm 40 or I'm 50 or wherever I'm at, that's, that's a rule of thumb for how much you should hopefully have saved, uh, save for say retirement uh, at that point in time. So if you're 40 years old, take your salary, multiply it by three, and hopefully you have three times your salary saved in retirement um, by, by that point. So that is exactly what that one uh, was. And I think that answered the question that just came in, it, it appears to be. So again, there's some information in, in the book on all of this. Uh, the next slide talks about, well, how do you save for cer certain goals? Here's an example. If, you're save, you know, if, you, if you have a $30,000 savings goal in five years, maybe you want to buy a car in five years. Well, if you're saving for that and putting in the bank savings, it, the math is simple. 30,000 divided by five years at six grand a year. You divide up at 12 months, hey, every month I need to save 500 bucks to meet that goal and you'll be there. If you're going to use an investment account that has a assumed rate of return, then it becomes a little bit more complicated and it's what we call future value calculation. Now, if you're trying to save $30,000 in five years, I'm not sure you should be putting it in stocks or bonds. You probably remember last week saying that there are stocks in particular are long-term investment. Bonds are, are, are not, you know, you can put in a CD or bonds uh, for, for that one as you, you do there. Uh, we have a good question that says about would you consider pension contributions as part of your retirement savings rate? Absolutely, yes. Um, you know, those uh, that pension contributions, sometimes, uh, you know, the employee has been putting money in and sometimes the um, you know, employer typically puts money in depending on, on uh, if you're a state employer or what you are. But yep, absolutely, that, that is the key. 
But if you're a, uh, say you're a teacher and you're putting in, I can't remember what the percent is, it's a six or seven or 8% of your salary is I think part of your contribution if, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, it's probably, that might not be enough. You might want to save some extra on the side as well. But you know, the school district is putting in as, as well in that case as, you know, too. So with trying to figure that out, if you, you know, trying to figure out what the future value calculation, the great thing about the internet, you can get, um, you know, almost any information out there. Uh, there's some calculators out there. There's some examples in the book on page 59 that give you some ones there. Um, the next section here, I'm going to really pick up the pace and breeze through these. There's lots of, I think, good information in here. Uh, dollar cost averaging is, is one of the things that's in the book. That's not what's up on screen right now, but in the book on page uh, 60 in, in uh, the PDF, there's uh, talks through dollar cost averaging. And that's buying a little bit, you know, every paycheck you're putting money into an investment account. A great way to build wealth and build an investment portfolio. And it walks through sort of some of the advantages of doing the, uh, that. In terms of, um, you know, what's on the screen right now, time and growth of money, uh, time is, is the most important factor in accumulating wealth. You know, it, there's no shortcuts. It's going to take time. That chart, you can see if, if you put $20,000 in a lump sum of investment this year, in any of those future years, in 20 years, if it grows at 5%, you're going to have $53,000. The longer it goes, the more powerful those numbers uh, add up. One point of interest, if we go from five years up to 40 years, that's eight times, right? Eight times five is 40. Uh, the investment result, if we go over to the, the far right column of 8% annualized return, the investment result is greater than eight times higher. I think it's uh, 50, almost 15 times higher. You know, 30,000 uh, in five years turns into 435,000. So that's the power of, of uh, what we're going to next, which is compound interest. So here's a quick question for you. Bob invests $5,000 per year in his 401k between ages 25 and 35 and then does not save any more. And again, so he's saving at the beginning of his career and then he stops saving after 10 years. He said, Fui, I've had enough of the saving. Uh, it's not growing fast enough. Susie, on the other hand, she does not save for those first 10 years, but she saves the same 5,000 per year into her 401k starting at age 35 and going up to age 65. So she's saving for 30 years, starts later. Bob saved for the first 10 years and uh, again, there's, and then stopped saving, but they're doing the best. So the, the question is, you can see there, and I'm going to pull up a poll question here on this very one and think about what your answer will be. And the question again is, who has more money in their 401k at age 65 at that point in time? So is it Bob or is it Su Susie? Some interesting results here. All right, most of you got it right, which the answer and the answers on the next slide, actually Bob would end up with more. And again, that's putting 5,000. So Bob put in, in 50,000 over the first 10 years. That's what the blue chunk is here. And that rest is all earnings and that's compounding interest. The money that you've earned is then growing as well as compounding and continuing to grow. Susie, on the other hand, put in $150,000 of contributions, even though she put in, she, she contributed for 30 years and Bob only did 10, Bob ends up with more because he started earlier. And that is simply just, um, you know, again, the result of, of um, starting early. It's never too late to start but it's uh, an important thing to, uh, to keep in mind. So you can um, always, always catch up or always uh, get started there. Um, there's a couple of different ways, you know, some, sometimes folks say, hey, how do I accumulate a million dollars? There's different ways to do it. In 20 years, if you wanna become a millionaire and, and you don't have, you know, you're not there yet and you have an 8% rate of return, you can either put in $200,000 in 20 years at 8%, that's gonna turn into a million, or you can contribute about $1,700 a month um, from that standpoint. Um, the next chunk of slides that are in here have some limit or some information on, on limits, sort of where to save and, and how to save um, for basically, you know, a lot of this is, is of course for retirement. 
So some of these limits into, um, in, into 401ks or employer plans, the basic limit is 19,500 in 2020. If you're over age 50, 6,500, you can catch up, meaning that combined, if you're over age 50, you can contribute a total of $26,000. Um, in IRAs, um, anybody can contribute 6,000. It's debatable if it's deductible or not, but you can contribute 6,000. And to catch up a, a contribution there for if you're over age 50 is a thousand bucks there. Uh, some of the other plans, there's some limits here. There's also some limits in the, in the book. Um, a couple of things, not everybody is eligible to contribute to a Roth IRA. We've talked about Roth IRAs being quite good. Not everybody is eligible. It depends on your income limits. Basically, if your income limits, depending on how you file taxes, single or married filing jointly, if, if your income limits are above here, you cannot contribute to a Roth IRA. If your limits are below the yes, if MAGI, and that's modified adjust, just a gross income, uh, yes, you can contribute to a Roth IRA there. And if you're in between, it phases out. Um, if you have a Roth option in a 401k, uh, this says this in the book as well. Anybody can contribute to the Roth in a 401k. There are no income limits. Uh, there are ways to uh, deduct your IRA contribution depending on some factors. If you or a spouse is covered by employer plan at work, there's some income limitations as well. All of this is in the book. Oops, didn't want to go that fast, but there are uh, all this is in the book. Um, some other things with IRAs, spousal IRAs. Uh, if you have a spouse that's a stay-at-home uh, stay spouse, um, that, that's something absolutely they can make contributions to their own IRA. Uh, happens all the time. They you just have to make sure that the, uh, the working spouse, in this case, the one that, that's earning that, that income, uh, will have um, you know, enough income to, to offset that. But as long as you uh, have that, the, a stay-at-home spouse can absolutely save to that. Uh, Roth conversions used to be a little bit more popular than they are right now. Uh, there can be some reasons to convert Roths. Again, some information in the book, and when I say convert Roths, convert to a Roth. So maybe you have a traditional IRA that you convert. If, if you want to talk through this, you know, you can reach out. We can talk through that. I'm not going to spend time really talking through it tonight just for the sake of time uh, within there. And then additional ways to save. So maybe if you maxed out in your retirement accounts, uh, whatever your retirement account vehicle, whether that's uh, you know, 19,500 in a 401k, or if you're over 50 to 26,000, and you wanna save in additional methods you know, for short-term savings, um, bank accounts, CDs, high quality short-term bond mutual funds can be a good way to do it. Longer term savings, again, five years or more, Low cost, broadly diversified mutual funds or ETFs are always good ways to, to, to do it that, that way as well. So a couple of things sort of just to be careful of. And again, uh, I don't want to label anything as, as a horrible thing to do. There's merit to everything out there. So you can see here, um, you know, put whole life insurance as an investment. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, in my opinion, insurance is insurance, investment is investment. Don't cross the two. Uh, be careful of deferred annuities, so, uh, equity indexed annuities or variable annuities. A lot of advisors love to push those. Advisors who work on commissions often love to push those because their commission is very, very high for annuities. So my advice would be, unless you completely understand what you're buying, don't get into it. Make sure you ask lots of questions before you sign in the dotted line. Uh, individual REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, something else to generally stay with uh, away from REIT mutual funds, no problem whatsoever. But individual REITs, um, sort of like individual stocks, those can be fairly risky um, and some of those fall out. Uh, I know somebody very dear to me that years ago bought a $30,000 individual REIT uh, when it sort of uh, you know, fell apart from a couple years into it. It was paying 9% interest for the first couple years, stopped paying interest, started paying a little bit of interest, and finally paid out, and this person got $9,000 from a $30,000 investment. There's a lot of risk with some of those, and, and I would stay far away from them. Alternative investments, limited partnerships, some of the other ones uh, often might be better to stay away from unless you exactly know what you're getting into. And bus, basically the bottom line is any investment you fully don't understand those, those risks, that's something you wanna stay away from. So moving along, College savings or college education planning. Uh, for those of you out there that have children, and many of you have grandchildren as well, so applicable across the 
uh, the board. There's, there's a variety of ways to save for college. Um, probably the, the most general or the best way in, in a lot of, in most appropriate in a lot of situations is what's called a 529 college savings plan. Um, so a couple of thoughts on, on 529 plans. Uh, they're sponsored by states. Pennsylvania has a 529 plan. Uh, Pennsylvania's is uh, administered by the PA Department of Treasury, and it's what's uh, referred to as direct sold, not broker sold. Uh, brokers or advisors that work on commission often push broker sold 529 plans. There are some decent ones of those out there as well. Um, personally, for my kids, I use the, the direct sold one through the PA Department of Treasury. PA529.com is their website. That's uh, some information in the book. Open access meaning no residency requirements. Uh, you can be a grandparent who's a PA resident. You can open up a Nevada 529 account for your grandchild who lives in Texas, but ends up going to college in Florida. So the borders don't matter here in the US. Sometimes internationally they might. So you gotta be careful of that. But uh, living in the US here, there's no um, limitations throughout there. Uh, tax benefits for contributions as a PA resident, assuming you are a PA resident, uh, you can get a state income tax deduction for putting money in. State income tax rate in Pennsylvania is 3.07%. Uh, so you get that as a deduction for putting money in. There's no federal tax deduction for it. Uh, ownership structure, only one person can own the account and it has to be an adult. The, uh, the beneficiary of the account is the child. So whoever you're saving for and only one beneficiary per account one owner for account, one beneficiary for account. The good news is that you can change beneficiary at some point in the future. Um, so you can change to somebody else in your immediate or extended family. Uh, there are some limitations, but anybody in your immediate and, and, and extended family. So if you have a couple kids and child one doesn't use up everything that's in theirs, you can simply just roll it over to the second child and, and go from, uh, from there. If at the end of the day, there's still money in there, you can reclaim the assets. Um, there's, um, you, know, you get your principal back, any principal you put in, get that back penalty or tax free, but any earnings that you would get back, there is a penalty tax, a 10% penalty tax, plus um, they, they tax that uh, on top of the 10% penalty tax as well. So basically you don't wanna overfund it uh, from that component. Financial aid ramifications. Some of this is changing a little bit here. Um, assets owned by the parent, typically the parent is the owner of the account. Uh, assets owned by the parent are typically looked upon a little bit more favorable. We used to advise that grandparents should not own 529s because the formula of financial aid formula didn't look really favorably on that. Uh, that is starting to, to, to change. And actually, I think in one of the recent stimulus package, the one that was passed in late uh, December, there was some changes to that um, that make that a little bit uh, better to, to do. I know that uh, also changed some things negative with college planning and college savings in a couple of ways. But anyways, that was that. And then tax-free withdrawals. That's the point of 529 savings. You know, whatever you put in there, if you're a PA resident, you get a little bit of tax break up front, but the, the growth is tax-free. And as long as you withdraw it for um, education, that is tax-free. And again, as we said before, uh, tax-free in government often doesn't come in the same sentence very often. So Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, there's two, uh, they actually have two plans under their umbrella, PA529.com, information in the book. Uh, two choices. One is the investment plan. That's what the top of the screen says right now. If you have a five plus year time horizon, meaning your child's not going to be in school for the next five years and you're starting a new plan, this could be a good one to do. The owner assumes their investment risk. So this is an investment portfolio. You can choose, you can build your own portfolio and you have 17 different options, or you can choose the easy method, which is what I would do and which is what I have done. Uh, you can choose an age-based option, either conservative, moderate, or aggressive. For my kids, I pick the age-based moderate method. The great thing about that is it gets more conservative as they get older. So as you get closer to needing that money, if the market falls apart, you know there's a lot more protection in place. Uh, there's uh, information in the booklet about that. The guaranteed, uh, and these are some of the options that are out there uh, that are also in the book. Uh, there's a guaranteed savings plan as well. That's the second of the option. And if, if the time horizon is less than five years or you're really risk averse, um, that would be the better option. It is guaranteed savings plan. Basically, uh, they, your account grows, you put money in, it grows on based on tuition increases. 
uh, the guaranteed savings plan, that's what GSP is, that, that fund really assumes the investment risk. Uh, this is sort of like the pension of, of, of uh, saving for college where the, you know, in a pension, the employer assumes that risk. And, and in the 529, the provider, uh, in this case, PA 529 really assumes that risk. And you know what you're getting out there. They don't guarantee the fund. And basically what that simply means, if something goes bust or whatever like that, they're not gonna come in and make it whole. Uh, they're not gonna you know, raise tax dollars to, 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 to do that. But um, you know, it, there's a lot of guardrails in place. Again, the more conservative, the guaranteed. Uh, if you have a longer uh, time horizon, it would make sense to uh, probably do the investment plan. So we're gonna take a look at a case study. And um, before I move on to the next one, what I decided to do is pick a five month old. So you see a five month there old on the screen. And um, if anybody knows who that five month old is, go ahead and type it into the chat uh, box. See if anybody has a guess and knows who that is. And for those of you who don't, we'll uh, share who that, that little, uh, you know, the five month old is there. I think this is a couple months ago. So that's not when he was, when he was five months old. But let's say this five month old is going to go to college in 18 years or less. Um, there's a couple of different choices in this case study we're gonna look at. This, this child could go either to the average in-state public school, could go to Penn State, obviously we're in the state of Pennsylvania here, or um, you know, high, um, you know, high expectations in going to Harvard. So I think a lot, including the boy's grandmother guessed this, this correctly, it is Gil, Gilby. Uh, so Gilbert, um, Gilbert Whitaker. So Pastor Stephen and Courtney's son, that is him in case you didn't recognize that. So kudos, I think every, nobody guessed it in, incorrectly, <clears throat> pardon me. So that's a good thing. But let's say, so for Gilbert, um, let's assume he's gonna start college and he'll be here before you know it, uh, Pastor Stephen, you know, in 2038, doing four years, 6% annual increases in tuition. That's sort of the historical number. Hopefully that slows down a little bit, but every year increases in tuition have been somewhere in that neighborhood of 6% over the long term. Um, let's assume that there's a, a little bit more of a modest, a five and a half or a little bit greater percent rate of return on the investments between now and college. And again, as you get closer to college, it becomes more conservative. And let's say the goal is to fund 50% of college. Uh, that funded cost includes tuition, room and board, uh, and books and supplies. So here's what um, Pastor Stephen needs to start saving for. And Pastor Stephen says he already has a 529 form, so that, that's a great start. I see that in the chat. Uh, but right now, for the average in state public school, the annual cost right now is 26 and change. Uh, total four year future costs, meaning in those four years down in, in 18 years down the pike, that would be a total cost of 332,000. So uh, to save for, you know, fund 50% of that monthly savings uh, is, would be 390. If you have a lump sum of just 56,000 laying around Pastor Steve and you can throw that in and you can uh, fund half the account if he's going to an in-state school. Uh, down here at the bottom, it shows what the, in, uh, the tax-free appreciation would be. Let's move along to Penn State main campus. Uh, I know we have a lot of Penn State fans here. Um, and you can see that that's a little bit more expensive. So instead of 26,000 uh, cost right now, it's up to 31,000. So all the other numbers are a little higher. And like I said, I think he's going to be a Harvard boy, which is a $70,000 annual cost, uh, which you know a mere almost a million bucks in, in 18 years is what would, would happen there. Um, and so here are the, the, the different dollar amounts that I need to save there. The good deal with Harvard, though, that I'd point out is that there's, you know, if you stay for Harvard, there's $217,000 of tax-free appreciation. That's a really good deal. So I would really strive for Harvard if I were you, Pastor Stephen. But uh, he's saying he's a Princeton man, and he's also saying he can go to community college for two years and live at home uh, to cut back on expenses as well. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, there's a lot of resources out there for college saving uh, that's out there. Some of them when you're on your screen right now, these are all in the book, uh, a lot of unbiased resources that are out there um, and some other resources that are in the book that, that's there. So we're gonna finish up with characteristics of, financially sa of the financially savvy. Uh, these are some of the, those traits or characteristics that uh, folks that have had financial success often have. Uh, whether they're wise, they're organized, responsible, they have goals, uh, willing to make sacrifices, those needs versus wants, uh, some confidence, uh, patience, 
and also not materialistic. And there's some more uh, information in the book on some of those if you want to go there. But you know, the, the other thought uh, involving money is some lessons worth living. And you know, I'm sure you all know this, but you know, some people try to buy happiness. That typically doesn't work. Uh, if you ask yourself what enough really looks like, sometimes more is never enough. And true contentment, and, true contentment um, and, and joy doesn't come from anything that money can buy. Of course, just sort of uh, some, some good principles there to end with. So I'm going to um, refer to a couple things. If you are following along in the book, uh, page 77 has some resources there. Uh, there's three good books up there if you're a good reader uh, or you know, if you like reading, there's some uh, three books that are listed there. Millionaire Next Door, uh, Ultimate Financial Plan. Let me pull down the slides there. Uh, those books are all out there, uh, good, good books to use. Uh, the later two that, that are listed there are um, good sort of planning books that, that we go through there. Um, there's also a pretty good resource that's on a couple pages thereafter. I think it starts on page 81 of the printing materials. Uh, a couple pages later that says, am I on track with my finances? That is a fillable PDF. So you can certainly start filling in. Um, you know, you can just type right into that fillable PDF, save it, type in, you can do it that way. If you don't want to do it in the book. Uh, as I said earlier, there's, there's some things that I'm going to be sending out uh, via email, some resources, some electronic files. Uh, hopefully they'll be useful. But again, appreciate the questions for those of you who ask. Uh, if you have questions throughout the week, send me um, send me an email, send me a text, whatever you want to do. Uh, just you know, the important thing is to understand what we're discussing and, and making sure we have uh, doing that. A couple people who did ask questions this past week asked questions about cost of investments or cost of advisors and related items. So I'm going to try to work that in one of the next couple of weeks, probably in session four or five, um, for that. So really, you know, my closing thought for tonight. Uh, as I said a couple other times, there's very few absolutes in the world of finance. Uh, some are more backed by science, some's more of an art form, and there are you know, more than one ways to accomplish the same thing. So as you've been hearing, uh, I have some opinions personally and, and you know, from living this life for many years, and as a result, probably some biases of how to approach those various things. So it doesn't mean that you know, other approaches are not good or don't a merit, uh, but just again, I would say, make sure you fully understand all that you do financially. So next week, our focus will be on the retirement side of thing, uh, both for preparing for retirement, um, a little bit more specifics, and then living within retirement. So again, applicable uh, to, to all ages there. So until next time, uh, peace and blessings to everybody. And thanks again for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you.